Good morning. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate you getting on the line, man. Um, it's wonderful to be with you. Let me just introduce you to the people. Um, everybody, you 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 know this this gentleman. Uh, this is my brother, brother Mark Philpart. He is a part of the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. Let me say it again: the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. Not only is he a, 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 a proud husband, but he is a father to two and one on the way. Come on, somebody. Uh, we are happy to have him with us. We thank you for your life. Uh, we appreciate you and welcome. Welcome to the way, brother. <laughs> Good morning, brother Mike. I appreciate you having me. Uh, thanks to you and the way family. Looking forward to this conversation this morning. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just tell me, uh, how did you come to what are you doing and how did you come to uh, work at the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color? What are you doing right now? What's going on? Right on. Uh, happy to. So I am uh, so I'm officially a managing director at Policy Link and Policy Link supports and helps to coordinate the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. The Alliance is a statewide uh, advocacy network. Actually, pardon me. The Alliance is a national advocacy network um, that began in California in 2011. Okay. And uh, when it was founded, uh, it was really founded, you know, kind of as a pilot in three communities, Oakland, Fresno, and LA, really trying to figure out whether there was a way to move policy in, in, a, in a targeted fashion that would transform uh, systems that were failing boys and men of color, their families and communities. Right. Um, and the idea caught hold in such a way and community owned it in such a way to where now we're in over a dozen communities uh, throughout California. And wow. we have eight additional states outside of California, including wow. Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama, and Florida. And so, um, community organizations and affiliates in those places are trying to replicate the work that we have done here in California. In California, uh, since 2011, when we were founded, uh, we've advanced over 100 bills which have been signed into law across a wide array of issue areas. Um, everything that impacts boys and men of color, their families and communities, including health, education, uh, employment, and of course, uh, criminal legal system issues. And so uh, we have been an active partner in the legislature with legislators and uh, we work with community leaders to uh, really help them advance their agenda. Um, essentially, we are a vehicle for self-determination and power building. Uh, we allow for young people and people who are marginalized and vulnerable and locked out of the policymaking process, uh, people who are formerly incarcerated, et cetera. Um, to have voice, to have power in ways that uh, allow their agenda to be at the forefront in the capital. And so um, we, we try to disrupt the business as usual kind of approach to policy making, yes. uh, where lawmakers uh, do what's right for us without any input. Uh, and instead, we try to give them an agenda um, yeah. that, that they can advance that is from the people. Outstanding. Brother, we appreciate your work and we feel it and we feel it and we thank you. Um, I just want you to go. Uh, I want to go back because I'm curious with all of this um, policy work that you're doing. How did you come to do this policy work? What 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 was it? Was there something in your life? Um, was there just a you just you know heard heard the voice from heaven come down say, I need you in this area. How did you come to do get on? Uh, uh, be a part of this work yeah i appreciate the question and you know uh there are only a few of us uh who uh feel that divine call and um and have <laughs> one of those transformative moments and yeah. so uh yeah. I, i'm unfortunately not one of those you know i feel like i'm uh i'm being guided but you know yeah. I, I don't know if i can necessarily say you know this this is uh the moment when i heard the the, the, the spirit calling me. The clarion know, call, call, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, you know, this has been an evolution for me. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in South Central LA um, during the 90s when um, 
the LA uprising was, right. you know, at the forefront of the nation's um, attention. Yeah. And uh, that definitely shaped me. I would say that, you know, I had experiences growing up that um, I realized when I got to college and went to a black college um, in New Orleans, Xavier University, um, you know, other black people didn't grow up like me. <laughs> right, 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 so, right. <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, had a, a little bit of a different understanding of things, you know, uh, by virtue of that, you know, having seen uh, extreme violence, um, having seen, um, you know, military and national guard the m16s yeah. parole in my street telling me to get inside having yeah. uh been detained and arrested you know uh, for cur breaking curfew and we see how curfew is playing out now yeah. um and and being you know obviously it's selectively applied and so while other white youth were hanging out you know the, right. the black kids get rounded up y'all better so, get inside <laughs> exactly exactly yeah so, so, um, and, and, you know, all of those type of disparate experiences only continued to mount as I got older. And when I went to college and even grad school, um, you know, similar experiences, run-ins, problems, uh, challenges with authority, whether it's lawmakers or teachers or administrators. Mm -hmm. And so I always found myself um, in conflict with the powers that be. Um, yeah, yeah in one way up. or another. Yeah. yeah, in one way or another. And, you know, and I knew um, at, at, at some point, you know, I had to kind of like take in, you know, it wasn't that I was intentionally trying to cause trouble or be disruptive. Uh, but, you know, it was just that the, the way that the system operates is intentionally meant to catch us up. And yeah. I, um, you know, came to that realization uh, and wanted to make a change. Um, I wanted, you know, people to not have to experience the things that I experienced. I wanted people to, um, you know, and, and, and I, I know of and still am in communication with a lot of people who went through way worse and, and mm -hmm. who have had a tremendous amount of setbacks in, in their life in the way that really has limited their prospects. Um, yeah. And to me, that's criminal because when I think about their potential, uh, yeah. you know, these individuals were smarter than me, craftier than me, you know, yeah. more adept at working things out than I was, you know, yeah. had just really innate, um, uh, uh, you know, skills and capacities that were snuffed out by virtue of a system that did not reflect that did not prioritize their value, um, right. that did not see them as assets, that did not see them as worthy of being held onto, that did not see them as in need of support versus punishment. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we have too many people in our families and in our communities that fall into that category. And so I was tired of it and I wanted to be involved in, uh, in a vocation that would allow me to to do that for the, to work on these issues for the rest of my life. I wanted to work on injustice. I wanted to work on policy. Mm -hmm. I knew that I I, I wasn't necessarily um, interested in service delivery and kind of working in grassroots kind of capacity. Um, and I wanted to do policy advocacy. Um, and I felt like I found the perfect home in an organization that is definitely in touch with the grassroots allows me to be in touch with the grassroots and to build um, their power their voice to be able to advance the agenda that they want in the capital so we kind of play a middle role mm -hmm. um, in that you know the the people who i'm in service to are grassroots leaders and people who are on the front lines who are doing the organizing the protesting and right. they, um, the, the 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 work to bring people together and in the streets um, and then helping them advance their agenda in the capital. And so that right. that is the role that we have played. It's like uh, advocacy tech support for the people. So, you know, <laughs> we, we have been doing that and uh, I enjoy it tremendously. And it feels like, you know, there is such a, a, an immense need for it. Yeah. So tell me, how can we, uh, and I know you, you are working at a policy level, 
we have those, you know, uh, our church here at the way, uh, you know, we are social justice warriors around here. And, and we have people on the ground that are spread out in organizations, like you said. What can we do right now? What What's something that you're working on? Or is there something that you're working on? Um, and, and I've seen your, black, your background back there, black and brown unity. Uh, 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 give us something uh, that we can, how can we get involved? What, what can we do and where can we go uh, to plug into what, what you're doing and how can we aid, uh, aid the movement in that way? I, I appreciate that question. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges I think in, in our work is that um, too many of us are siloed. Too many of us don't have, you know, a clear kind of on-ramp to an opportunity to engage. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people don't understand what platforms exist, how you can contribute, um, and and what are the things that are immediately relevant in this moment. And, um, you know, our lack of organization, our lack of infrastructure is really what hinders our ability to have the power that we need to win. Yeah. And uh, I'm really, I'm really grateful to uh, people like Pastor Mike and our, our team at The Way you know, who, who work hard to bridge, build, to educate, to break down silos and, and really ensure that people um, are aware that there are so many different ways you can leverage uh, your capacities, your talents and your gifts in this particular moment um, from, you know, being in the streets to um, sitting at your house, sending emails and getting on the phone. Yeah. You know, there's something for everybody to do. And so um, we try to, within our work through the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, really set people up for that. Um, we, the legislature is actively um, uh, uh, you know, back in session in their um, policy making and deciding on the budget and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And so this is a prime time for us to make our voices heard. Um, you know, throughout the, the, the state, people have been calling, and throughout the country for that matter, people have been calling for the defunding of police. Um, yes. And we know that that is because, you know, police have been an oppressive force, um, yes. delivering extreme brutality and uh, oppression uh, to our communities um, more than they have been a protective force. Right. And we, um, uh, at the start of the year, for um, uh, uh, the, the pandemic and, you know, this this uh, massive kind of wave of police brutality really kind of kicked off. Um, we, we developed a bill with grassroots partners like the Anti-Police Terror Project and mm. Youth Justice Coalition in Los Angeles and um, Mental Health First in Sacramento, a whole host yeah. of others. Um, we developed a bill called the Crisis Act, the Community Response initiative yeah. to strengthen emergency systems. And this bill was essentially meant to fund community-based organizations to provide an alternative to traditional first responder each, um, across a range of issues um, to really help community-based organizations uh, provide support to vulnerable populations in times of crisis and times of uh, emergencies. Right. And so, um, the Crisis Act, AB 2054, authored by Assemblymember Kamlajer, is something that um, we encourage you to support. Um, it is a direct response to this moment, um, but it was developed, obviously, prior to the moment. Um, we believe that community organizations and individuals um, who are, are trained and who have relationships, uh, trusted relationships with people in community, um, have a better chance at being able to preserve safety, to being able to de-escalate and being able yeah. to help people. Um, and if I could just say just a couple quick examples um, sure. of what we mean uh, when we talk about community safety and how community organizations uh, are in a better position to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. Whether you're experiencing um, substance abuse, a crisis around substance abuse, a crisis around uh, domestic violence, uh, or a crisis around uh, uh, any set of issues you can imagine, whether you know it's related to public health crisis or you know public safety shutoffs. You know there is a need for people 
to um, get support in a way that is non-threatening. Right. Um, and anytime you bring uh, an officer, an armed officer, uh, into the equation, there is the risk of there being uh, a problem. Um, somebody's right. safety is immediately in jeopardy by virtue of someone with a weapon being at the scene. And if there were a way to um, have community organizations play a more significant role um, around issues that they're trained in, of course, and where there's um, some sort of relationship, I think it definitely helps um, uh, de-escalate and preserve safety as well as get people the help that they need in that moment. And we've had many conversations. I think the biggest challenge for people around this is like, well, what if somebody is in a, you know, violent situation, like domestic violence, for example. Right. Um, and, and what we're saying is not to, um, we're, we're, we're saying that not that we don't need, um, uh, uh, you know, some sort of intervention if there is a volatile and violent situation in the moment. But people don't wake up and become physically violent. There is a trajectory and an arc that can yes. be interrupted at any point. Yes. But because we solely and exclusively rely on law enforcement as the sole way to intervene, there is no right. way to get help. And if you call an officer or you call the police before violence has occurred, they will not support you because no crime has been committed. They will not right. come out. Right. And so what, what we're saying is we need investment in community organizations who will come out and support somebody who is potentially violent or who has anger issues um, and, and sit with that person and help them work through whatever anger issues they have, right? And whatever yes. challenges they may be facing to kind of de-escalate and tamp down that anger in a way that allows there to be preservation of peace in the household and in the community. Right. And so that's an example. I think we, we rely too much on law enforcement to do things that they're not equipped to do. Homelessness, right. um, uh, you know, that's another big area. Mental health is another mm -hmm. big area. So we are, we are simply trying to establish a program that would allow for more alternatives that would support people in the world. And so yeah. we see a yeah. relationship between, you know, the, the insidious nature of the criminal legal system and all the other things that we want in order to get free, right? In order to yeah. find our, our liberation and our ability to, you know, live fully self-determined lives. And so, um, you know, we don't, we believe that you can't do this work without looking at you know, health and without looking at education, without looking at workforce issues, it's all very much connected and it's part of a broader theory of change. And uh, I think the more of us that begin to understand that, to sit with that and to, um, you know, embrace the fact that, you know, we can't, you can't just be about one issue. You can't just be, if, if you're about black and brown liberation, you have to hold um, an abolitionist framework and mm -hmm. a perspective that is going to challenge the totality of the system yes. and not just one piece of it that you are more comfortable with and familiar yes. with, you know? Yes. And so um, this is, you know, lifelong journey um, for, for many of us. And, you know, I'm learning and growing every day. I don't always get it right. I'm not perfect, um, but I'm committed to it. And um, people who I work with are too. And, I think as long as you uphold that commitment and you know continue to study and act and do, um, you can't yeah. you can't separate the two. You have to you have to study and do and and, right. and keep those two together because it's really important that your actions are informed and yes. you are educated. Um, so I encourage everyone out there to continue to to to, to read to. To, to review the news um, from trusted sources, obviously, um, right. and to, you know, stay abreast of, you know, just, uh, I think there are so many luminaries out there who are issuing, um, you know, great reads for our people. I think there's uh, a real need for us to be uh, focused on, you know, um, uh, staying abreast of, of that information and the knowledge that they're pushing out because, um, you know, that that uh, 
political education is really the, the heart and soul of, of our movement um, and the heart yes. and soul of where we um, can find inspiration uh, for this liberation journey that we're all on. Amen. Political education, people. Yes. Well, brother, thank you so much, man. Um, we thank you for your life. Uh, we thank you for your, uh, please uh, thank your family for allowing you to uh, take this time and get on the call, man. We're going we're gonna to let you get back to it, back to life. But we just, we love you to life, brother. We thank you for what you're doing um, and uh, continue to work. We're praying for you. Preach, pray, and resist in Jesus' name. Appreciate you. In Jesus' right on, name. Brother. I appreciate you. Thank yes, you, brother sir. Mike. All right. Yes, sir. God bless. Bless you.